Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Bible study here again on Friday night. Let's continue where we're leaving off uh, last time here in the book of Acts. We got through Acts chapter 16, so tonight we'll do chapter 17 and get into chapter 18. We'll see how far we can go there in uh, the time that we have. I hope that you find uh, the Bible studies helpful. What we try to do is make the meaning clear to explain these things from uh, the standpoint of uh, the context in which you're written, uh, also uh, using all the materials at our disposal for notes to explain these things from college notes and ambassador to good news and plain truth articles and uh, letters from personal correspondence course or even the um, ambassador college uh, Bible study or correspondence course. So anyway, let's uh, go into chapter 17 here tonight. And it begins with uh, some preaching that's occurring here at Thessalonica. It says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So it seems, or it would seem, that there was not much of a Jewish population in the first two cities mentioned here. Therefore, Paul and his companions that were traveling with them went on to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews and a large Jewish population, which gave him a platform on which to reach the people. Once again, the rulers of the synagogues would often invite traveling uh, people such as Paul you know, that were well-versed in scriptures and, and give them an opportunity to speak in the synagogue. So this was a great place uh, for Paul to launch off. And we see he did that many times in the cities he went to. He started with the Jews and then he'd move on to the Gentiles and work with them if the Jews rejected him. It says in verse two, then Paul as his custom was went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. This was his custom to be in the synagogue on the Sabbath. We see the same thing with Jesus Christ. We see it with others in uh, these books of the New Testament, it was their custom. That's where you would find them on the Sabbath. It's just where they were. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, is it our custom to be at Sabbath services and assemble with people on a weekly basis? Is that where people will find us or they have to flip a coin to, to see if we're going to be there or not? Um, I realize some of you are scattered and don't have the opportunity right now to assemble. Uh, that's different. That's why we have this technology and why we use it. But people who can assemble should be assembling on the Sabbath as commanded, and it should be their custom as it was Paul's. Verse 3, it said, explaining and demonstrating, that he's reasoning here from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So what Paul was trying to do here, he and Silas, who had you know, come here, I'm sure, with the, the, the marks from the beating that they had received still on them, still on them from that. Uh, but we see Paul and Silas here. Paul's as fearless as ever. He's speaking with boldness and power. He's reasoning it from the scriptures in the synagogue. And he's explaining and bringing forth proofs uh, maintaining that, look, Christ had to suffer and die. And this is, let me tell you who he was and, and let me fill you in as to the uh, prophecies in the Old Testament and how they have been fulfilled. There was a necessity here that Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, was predicted in the scripture to suffer and die and to be resurrected, Paul was saying. And he's pointing out to the Jews something that they frankly were unwilling to admit. And it was essential here for Paul's argument to prove that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the one the Old, Old Testament prophets had prophesied to come, that he would come, suffer, and die for the sins of the people, and then be resurrected back to life. And there were many Old Testament scriptures that Paul could go to to point this out, that talked about the crucifixion of the Messiah. Uh, he could have went to Psalm 22. He could have went to Isaiah 53, which we regularly go to uh, each Passover. He could have went to the book of Zechariah in chapter 12 and many other 
points of scripture in the Old Testament that talked about the coming Messiah, about his suffering and death, about his resurrection. And these things were predicted, uh, as Paul was pointing out to them, in the Old Testament by the prophets. And Christ himself in the New Testament uh, also talked about how he was fulfilling uh, those prophecies. An example is Luke 24, verses 25 through 27. He says here, and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So there were many infallible proofs that Paul could point to to show that those Old Testament scriptures had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ of Nazareth and his first coming. And he says in verse four, and some of them were persuaded in a great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women, uh, women joined Paul and Silas. Only a few Jews were persuaded, but a great multitude, it says, of these devout Greeks. Uh, they became members of the church. Uh, they were Greeks who had renounced the worship of idols. Uh, they were attending the synagogue. They were not, by the way, fully admitted to the privileges of a Jewish proselyte up until this point because the Jews refused to accept them. Uh, they were considered proselytes of the gate. Uh, a proselyte, by the way, if you wonder what that is, is a person who is converted from one religion to another. And he mentioned not a few leading women, and I think Probably the, the reason that Paul does this, or Luke in the, sorry, Luke in the uh, book of Acts, is most of the people that God calls are the weak and the base. And so this was different for many women of distinction to be called. A lot, in, in many cases, in a lot of cases, those would have been wives of the principal men of the city. In other cases, they may be widows, but were still you know, wealthy, leading, uh, prominent women uh, in the city. So he mentions a great multitude of devout Greeks, a few, not a few leading women, quite a few of them, and a few Jews were um, called into uh, the truth. Verse five, but the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Uh, this Jason was uh, a friend of Paul. Uh, Jason had lodged Paul and his uh, companions. And these Jews who frankly were envious and losing maybe some of their following um, felt their positions were certainly in danger or threatened, being threatened, were angry. And they were also angry that Paul and others were preaching that the Gentiles could be saved. So these Jews went into the marketplace and the marketplace was a place where people who were idle assembled, people who were looking for jobs would assemble. Uh, people were, you know, just hanging out there uh, and the Jews went right there to assemble a mob. There's a good place to gather them up. Uh, these people usually were of the lower or baser sort that would just hang out there. And they were just the kind of people you need to form a mob. They would easily be excited to acts of violence and, and do whatever you ask them to do, especially if you could kick them a little money. And so they attacked the house of Jason. That's where Paul and his companions were lodged. Verse six, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Now, when they say these who have turned the world upside down, they don't mean that in a good sense. Uh, they're saying, look, Paul and these guys have unsettled things. They've disturbed the peace. Uh, in the mouth of these accusers, it was a charge really of sedition, um, of disobedience to the Roman law. So that wasn't a positive thing coming from their mouth. So Jason has harbored them, Paul and uh, those who were with him. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. 
Now, in AD 49, the Roman Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome. And the reason he did that is they were beginning to riot. And the rioting was really being ignited by a real zealous group of Jews. And they were considered insurrectionists. And they were advocating revolution against Rome. They were opposing the installation of this new king, uh, Claudius. And so they all got kicked out um, by him. And Paul's accusers here are trying to paint him as a seditionist, as somebody who was also trying to stir up a revolution against Thessalonica. Now, they were twisting his words. They were perverting his words. Jesus Christ was not at that point coming as a conquering king to try to usurp the authority of the Roman officials. Uh, that, that's going to happen this time. He's going to depose uh, all governments. He's going to overthrow those governments. And he will be a conquering king of kings and lord of lords. But at this point, that's not what he came at. Uh, Jesus did not come at that point as a conquering king, but as a lamb for the slaughter. And when they spoke of Christ as a king, uh, they twisted that. And, and that's the charge they were leveling. Verse 8. And when they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city, when they heard these things, so when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let him go. Taking security would be much like posting bail or uh, posting um, um, bond, uh, you know, for uh, someone. So it was meant here, this posting of the bond was meant as an assurance that there would be no trouble caused by Paul and, and the companions of Paul or Jason or any of the rest of them. And so once they had taken security or similar to posting bond, they let them go. So obviously the magistrates did not consider the evidence very weighty. They did not punish anybody here. They didn't put anybody in prison. They let them go. Verse 10, then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And I think the reason they sent him away by night, this wasn't quite over. Uh, these Jews and, and the mob had not really calmed down and they were still going to try to go after Paul. And so they said, look, for your own safety, you got, you got to go. And so they sent him away by night to Berea. Berea was about 50 miles southwest of, of where they were here about 80 kilometers, that's quite a hike. Berea was a city of Macedonia. Its ancient name, by the way, is said to have been derived from the abundance of the city's waters. There were numerous beautiful streams that ran through the city. Uh, they had a lot of trees, if you look at history, that shaded beautiful gardens. Uh, it was truly a beautiful uh, paradise, Berea. Verse 11, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So the Bereans received the gospel message and the truths that were being taught by the Apostle Paul and, and others with interest and without prejudice. They were attentive they were respectful to what they were hearing and being taught and did not reject the message. But they also searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They would go through the Old Testament scriptures, mainly here concerning the things which Paul was preaching concerning Jesus Christ and his suffering and death and resurrection. They wanted to know whether these things, these teachings of Paul and Silas were in accordance with the scripture. Whether they were so, they were proving all things. Uh, God tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, you know, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Uh, the new King James says, test all things. But either way, God wants us to prove it, to test it, to study it, to make sure that when we read uh, an explanation or hear one in a Bible study like this, um, that it's so. And they were, that's exactly what they were doing. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Meredith, others that have uh, been leaders in the church have regularly said, hey, don't believe me, prove it, open your Bible, study it. Uh, once you prove it and embrace it, then it's part of 
uh, who you are and the way you think, and you're willing to put it all on the line when you've proven it, known it, and stand behind what you know to be true. So it's important to, to prove things. Verse 12, therefore many of them believed, and, not, uh, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So again, here we see many Greeks, prominent men and women, people of, you know, that had position and influence and wealth, uh, they were leaders in, in the city, are mentioned. So this, this was a big deal. It'd be like us uh, today uh, preaching and getting the attention of all the, the local uh, government leaders and maybe even state leaders uh, and have them start attending church. So it, it was mentioned for a reason by Luke. Verse 13, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Uh, they, they really didn't like what Paul had to say and, and what uh, Silas and others had to say. Then immediately it says, brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained. So obviously the fury of the persecutors was not as hot against Silas and Timothy. So they stayed back and continued to teach. Paul again sent away for his own safety. And he goes on foot as far as the sea, as far as he can go until he gets to the coast. Verse 15, so those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Paul moves on to Athens. He says, look, Silas, Timothy, get over here as quick as you can. I want you to join me as quick as possible. I need your help. Uh, I desire your company. And I'm not going to do anything till you come. I'll wait till you get here. And we see that Paul later changed his mind. We see in 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2, that he stayed alone in Athens and he sent Timothy back uh, to where they had just come from to Thessalonica to comfort, encourage, and strengthen the brethren that had been called. Verse 16, now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. So when he gets to Athens, what Paul finds is a city absolutely full of idols. Athens was the most celebrated city in Greece. There was no city in Greece, or frankly in the ancient world, that was so distinguished for philosophy, learning, and the arts as Athens. Um, and Paul is really deeply troubled by the numerous pagan temples and idols and altars that he saw everywhere in the city of Athens. Verse 17, therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So not only in the synagogues, he also had down the marketplace, uh, the center of the city's life, and that's where the philosophers would be meeting and they would philosophize and, and have these discussions. And it would be an opportunity for Paul to have some people to, to, to talk to and preach to. Verse 18, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, babbler literally means seed picker or gutter sparrow, a small bird like a finch that snatches up scraps of food. And Paul was not this eloquent philosopher that those men of Athens were. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1, we read that. And so these arrogant guys are ridiculing Paul, and they're arguing this guy's not sophisticated enough to be even taken seriously. And others, it says, thought that Paul was advocating foreign gods in the name of Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, they, they just didn't get it. Now, who were the Epicureans and who were these Stoic philosophers? Uh, we could give an entire Bible study on each one and, and still not cover all the things they believed and taught. Uh, I want to just scratch the surface so that you understand these two different schools of Greek thought and briefly explain what they, what they believe, what they taught, so you can understand what Paul was 
dealing with here, what he was encountering. The Epicureans took their name from their founder, and the founder of their school of thought was Epicurus. The Epicureans held that, um, well, they held meetings, honestly, in a garden, and Epicurus had left this garden uh, by his will, uh, in trust, as a place where his disciples could safely meet and assemble. And, and sometimes these guys were known as the school of the garden, that, that school of thought. Now, they believed that the gods in their eternal tranquility were far too uh, important and far, far away. And, and, and they were not going to, these gods were not going to trouble themselves with man's sorrows or his sins. These people felt like they didn't need any sacrifices. They didn't need any answers to prayer. They didn't need a God. They denied the world, frankly, was created by God. And they believed that the world to be the effect of mere chance. They asserted that sensual pleasure was man's chief good and that virtue was to be practiced only as it contributed to pleasure. So experience taught that these guys who indulge themselves in whatever pleasures they wanted to, more often than not, uh, these pleasures would counterbalance with pains and suffering sorrow that followed. And so therefore, the teacher Epicurus said that the essential excesses should be avoided uh, because they reaped consequences. Now, they were confident that the world was not under the administration of a God of justice. There were no rewards. There were no punishments after death. They rejected the idea that there was a creator controlling the universe, and they believed that matter had existed for eternity. Now, the problem with this way of thinking was that even though the founder, Epicurus, was uh, by all counts a fairly moderate, normal uh, person, his ideas were taken to the next level and to the next level. And this sect became, became very corrupt. And basically, if you were to describe the sect with one, one word, it would be uh, pleasure. That's all they cared about. And Paul's main argument against this sect and what follows here is proving that um, the world was created by and the world was governed by a living and powerful God. And so it was his main argument against them. Now the Stoics, on the other hand, you, you know the word Stoic. Uh, it, you think of somebody who's got no emotion, no feeling, they don't smile, they don't laugh, they don't cry, they're just Stoic. Uh, there's a reason the word Stoic is applied to a person that this, you know fits that description. Uh, they did not take their name from their founder. The founder of the Stoics was Zeno. Uh, Zeno of Citium in Cyprus. They took their name rather from a porch at Athens, and the porch was adorned with paintings on a wall of the Battle of Marathon, and that's where Zeno would go, and that's where he would teach his disciples. These people, the Stoics, believed the universe was created by a god, but that all things were ruled by fate. Even God was subject to fate. So they spoke of a divine mind, that pervaded the universe and it ordered things by its providence. But true wisdom consisted of being the master, not the slave of circumstances. The disciples of this stoic school of thought taught that true wisdom, again, consisted of being the master, not the slave. And so they were indifferent to pain and pleasure. Uh, their aim was for absolute apathy. And apathy means complete lack of interest no concern. They shut off sympathy for anybody. Uh, that disturbed their internal tranquility and therefore they were not involved with the emotions uh, and, and up and downs of any of that. Now, these Stoics were sought for as tutors by many of the sons of noble families because they're very disciplined and, and very strict and very focused in their studies. Uh, they really try to strive for some high ideals. The problem was it was really nothing but a mask for selfish and corrupt lives that they lived. 
And when we read Josephus, the historian Josephus' writings, he compares them to the Pharisees in the days of Christ. He says these guys were hypocrites. They thought they were more righteous than everybody else. And Paul would come along and preach to the Stoics about the need for a savior, about a need for pardon and redemption, uh, teach them they could do nothing of their own strength apart from God. And the Stoics would, would not like that message from Paul. The main characteristics of them, if we want to sum it up in one word, would be pride. So Epicureans pleasure, the Stoics pride. So that's just a brief summary of what the two schools of thought were all about. Okay, verse 19. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, um, literally Hill of Ares or Mars Hill is another name for it, saying, we know, uh, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. Now, just south of the uh, southwest, I think, of the Acropolis, if you look at a map, um, in Athens was a hill, that hill again, Mars Hill or Hill of Ares. It is the uh, god of war. It's his hill. Uh, the court of Areopagus was the oldest and most revered, revered tribunal in all of Athens. And this is where court was held concerning doctrines of religion and morals and things like that. So Paul is brought before this tribunal as being supposed to want to introduce a new religion or a new mode of worship. Uh, they were willing to hear what he had to say before they condemned him or before they examined and approved what he had to say. They were always looking for more knowledge and new things. And so Paul wasn't brought here as an enemy. He was brought here to present what he believed and what he taught. And so these guys would examine the gospel message that Paul taught, and these guys were supposed experts in philosophy and religion. Verse 20, it says, For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, therefore we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and foreigners who were in, the, who were in there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear some new thing. So now we're going to get in verse 22 into the sermon that Paul gave to these heathen people who worship false gods and were without the knowledge of the true God who thought they were so important and so smart, uh, very arrogant people. And Paul's main objective in what he's about to deliver by way of message is to convince them of the folly of idolatry and lead them to repentance and to know the true God. So what he's about to say is the exact opposite of what they taught, believed, and were all about in this city and in this tribunal. Verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. So Paul opens here trying to draw them in, and this isn't a... A, a uh, correction or uh, admonishment coming from Paul. In effect, he's saying, uh, I see that you are in all aspects very religious. And so it was a compliment, not a criticism, that Paul opens his speech with to the men of Athens. Verse 23, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. So Paul uses what he finds. He finds this altar with the inscription to the unknown God. He goes, look, I'm going to tell you who the true God is, the one that you don't know. And again, he's drawing him into the speech. It's an opportunity here for Paul. Verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, Oops, we can see, you know, who's going to be upset here. He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So when Paul spoke of the true God being the creator of the world, the creator of everything in it, he's opposing the opinion that matters eternal as believed by the Epicureans. And in that all things were controlled by fate as taught by the Stoics, he's opposing it. 
And the Lord of heaven and earth is being presented by Paul as someone who's, as a being that is sovereign over all of it. And he says, the true God cannot be confined to temples made with hands. And you guys err greatly in thinking that you can erect these magnificent temples and images and you can consecrate them and then draw God down into them. Uh, God is way more important and way bigger than that. Nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God doesn't need sacrifices and meats prepared by men's hands as though he needs to be fed. God doesn't ever have to eat if he doesn't want to. He's God. You know, David, even in Psalm 53, let's go there because it certainly fits. In Psalm 53, verse 16 and 17, uh, David said this, and remember, David lived in a time when they did have animal sacrifices. But David says, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. You know, God is the, the creator. He created everything that exists. He sustains it. He doesn't need anything from man. In Isaiah 42, in verse 5, uh, another verse that fits well here, Isaiah 42, verse 5, says, Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. So God created all this. And once again, you guys, with all your idols and all your images, uh, you miss the whole point. Verse 26, he has made from one blood, with Adam, right, and then Eve, from one blood every nation of man to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Now we see in the Old Testament that God set boundaries between nations. Uh, he used mountains, he used seas and rivers and the like, and God appointed these things, he established these things, he divided the inheritance to the nations. It says in Deuteronomy 32, verse eight, and also in Genesis 10. And so this is the kind of God that, that Paul is presenting. Verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow up for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. You know, those who are not called grope in the darkness trying to find the truth, trying to find the true God. And yet Paul said, God's not far from any of us. He, he's, the proofs of his existence are all around us. The proofs of his power are all around us. They're everywhere. Uh, verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. There are a number of Greek poets that you can go back and, and look at that can be quoted as using this phrase, we, for we are also his offspring. Uh, Aratus in a poem entitled The Phenomena uh, did one, um, and, and many others. Uh, but again, we know that God uh, created us in his image, in his likeness, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and that uh, we are his offspring and that we have the incredible human potential of one day being born into his very family. He says in verse 29, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by uh, art and man's devising. These things, gold and silver and stone, were used in the making of images and idols and statutes of the gods. And Paul says it's absurd to think that the source of all life and all intelligence resembles a lifeless idol of gold or silver or stone. Verse 30, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So God in his long suffering and mercy allowed mankind to go through the course of life in ignorance and in idolatry and he overlooked it. But he says, look, God commands men everywhere to repent once you know better. 
Now, God wasn't calling everyone everywhere on the earth at that time, and he's not doing it today either. But God was calling some of the Jews, some of the Gentiles from all over the earth, various parts of the planet. And in this case, God was also using Paul to witness to the people that he was able to speak to in the marketplace or in a synagogue, or in this case, before the philosophers at this tribunal. Verse 31, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So we know, and the scriptures point out, that the time's coming when God will judge the world. He's gonna judge the nations, both Jews and Gentiles, in accordance with the principles of justice and in righteousness. And this, again, would be contrary to the beliefs of both the Stoics and the Epicureans. And the assurance that God the Father gave that the judgment's coming was by raising Jesus from the dead because the Father appointed the judgment to the Son. In John 5, 22, it says, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And by raising Christ from the dead, um, then he could be that judge. If he was dead and buried and, and became ashes, uh, he couldn't be the judge that the prophecy said he would be. Uh, verse 25, John 5, just drop down a few verses, John 5, 25. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he's granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So Paul's argument was, look, the Old Testament scriptures pointed to a Messiah, Christ, who would come and die and be resurrected. And the proof is that he's going to judge what it is that he has been resurrected. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So it ignited a reaction here among the Athenians when Paul brought up the idea of resurrection. And when it says they mocked, that implies they, they gave him the looks and they gestured in a mocking way. And they also had the words of derision come out of their mouth. However, some of them, some of them said, we'll hear you again on this matter. Uh, we don't ever see that happening in the pages of the book of Acts or any other New Testament scripture. So it appears that uh, they didn't hear him on the matter again in the future. At least there's no evidence of that. Uh, verse 33, so Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysus, the Areopagite, a woman named Demarius and others with them. So only a few were called in Athens. Paul's not going to expose the work of God to the jest of scoffers anymore. And there's no record of Paul ever going back to this city of Athens either. But a few, God called a few, and the trip bore some fruit. All right, let's uh, get into chapter 18. Looks like we've got time to get a good start in this chapter. And we're gonna begin here with Paul ministering at Corinth. It says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. Corinth is the center for the worship of Aphrodite, uh, she was known as the goddess of fertility. And this city housed the temple of Apollo. Now, sensuous uh, nature of religion in this city was off the charts. Uh, the religious cult of Aphrodite and uh, this city of Corinth had a reputation of, of being a city of immora uh, immorality. Uh, pretty much anything went, uh, fornication common and other sexual sins were common in the city of Corinth. And the Greeks actually started using the word uh, Corinthian or to act like a Corinthian as a synonym for sexual immorality uh, by the fifth century BC because it was such a corrupt city. Verse two, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila born in Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, 
because Claudius had commanded that all the Jews uh, commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And uh, he came to them, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for occupation, for by occupation, they were tent makers. And we've already mentioned that Claudius commanded all the Jews to get out of Rome. He was trying to you know, stop rioting, get rid of any kind of uprising or insurrection. That here, Aquila and, and Priscilla had left, they had fled, they're now here with Paul, and they're in the same occupation. They're tent makers, just like Paul. And a tent maker literally was a manufacturer of tents that were made of skin or cloth. And the tents back then were normally made from the hair of goats. Uh, that hair was also used for sails for ships. So it was durable. It was tough. Uh, the Apostle Paul's a tent maker. Aquila and Priscilla are, are tent makers. And so they worked together. We know that Paul was a tent maker throughout his life, that he provided for himself and his companions by practicing this trade. He didn't want to take money from the churches, even though he certainly could have. God said so. Uh, he just wanted to be above that and says, look, use your money to help the poor and the needy, and I'll take care of myself. And uh, he was a tent maker, and so were these two. And so they spent some time together. And we see in the New Testament, Paul and Aquila and Priscilla being together and interacting several times. Uh, and Paul mentions them in some of his epistles as well. Okay, verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was constrained by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Again, Paul's custom, he comes in a new city, first thing he does is the synagogue, and he testifies to the Jews. After several attempts to teach the Jews of Corinth, with very little success, by the way, Paul then turns his attention almost exclusively to the Gentiles. It says in verse 6, But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Whenever he shook his garments, right, it was an act of shaking off the guilt of their condemnation. He said, the blood's on your head, the guilt's on yourself, your destruction is your own. I'm clean. I'm not to blame for this, okay? You guys take responsibility. And from now on, this point forward, look, I don't have anything to do with you. I'm going to minister to the Gentiles. Verse 7, he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. And we see that Paul actually baptized Crispus with his own hands. Uh, 1, 1 Corinthians 1.14 tells us that. Um, so now it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, so do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. Look, Paul, I'm calling a bunch. I'm calling many people in the city of Corinth. And I want you to just boldly preach the truth. Be fearless about this. Don't be afraid. Uh, don't keep silent. But I'm going to also comfort you here and let you know you're not going to get attacked in this city and you're not going to get hurt. So go for it. Because look at the track record. Paul been beat up and, uh, you know, locked up and gone through so much pain and torture. And God says, look, I'm going to give you a little calm water here for a bit. Okay, I'm going to give you a break. Don't worry about it. Um, he, he received a lot of severe treatment elsewhere, but God says, I'm going to protect you, support you, comfort you. I got it. And I got a lot of people that were calling in this city. So verse 11, uh, he continued there for a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So a whole year and a half goes by. Now when Gallio, uh, Gallio was proconsul of, and this word is pronounced Achaia. It doesn't sound like it, but I checked it up because I'm like, how do you pronounce it? Achaia. The Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Now in the spring of 52 AD or AD 52, a proconsul named 
Gallio was appointed by the Roman Senate to govern the province of Achaia or Greece. <clears throat> Gallio was a brother of the famous Stoic philosopher Seneca. And Seneca possessed a great deal of influence in Rome. And you may have heard of him or seen uh, statues of him or busts of him. Now, Gallio, according to historians, was commended as a man of ex excellent disposition. He was beloved by all men. Uh, he was not subject to vice, and he was a hater of flattery. So by all accounts, that's a pretty good uh, reputation and <clears throat> a pretty good record. Now, on the other hand of this, we see that this man, this proconsul. Uh, that the Romans had appointed had really no regard for the scriptures. Um, the law of God was beneath him and beneath his notice. He didn't care for Paul and he certainly didn't care for the Jews. Now, it says they brought him to the judgment seat. So the habit of the Roman governors of provinces was to hold court in the marketplace on fixed days and grievances could be heard that way. So the Jewish leaders go, look, we got, we got an opportunity here. We got a golden opportunity. Let's take advantage of this. There's a brand new governor and let's rid ourselves of Paul. Let's get him out or, or get him killed. Now they bring Paul before the judgment seat of the governor. And this is a pretty big deal. And the Roman governor, if he ruled against Paul and what Paul taught, would set a precedent and encourage immediate persecution of other Christians in Corinth. So... They say to the proconsul to Gallio, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. So the Jews brought Paul to Gallio to have him punished because he opposed the law of Moses. And in part, he, he opposed that by not requiring Gentiles to be circumcised. And they're demand, demanding civil action and were claiming that Paul had committed a criminal offense they twist it, try to say, look, he's against Rome as well, but this guy doesn't buy it. It says, when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there'd be a reason why I should bear with you. But look, you know, this isn't, this guy's committed no crimes. He hasn't done anything against the Roman Empire. You know, I, I'm, I don't care about this. He had so much contempt for the whole matter and so much contempt for the Jews. And frankly, he didn't care about Paul either. He said, I don't even need to listen to Paul's defense. I don't care. And you guys are intolerable. Uh, you're wasting my time. So in verse 15, it says, but if it's a question of words and names and your own law, Look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. It's interesting, Paul did not even have to open his mouth to defend the faith. God already provided Paul's defense. He had prepared Gallio to make the correct decision. There had been no crime committed against Rome, and Gallio had his bailiffs drive these accusers out of his presence. So the hand of God, once again, had preserved the life of his faithful servant uh, servants in this case. Verse 16, and he drove them from the judgment seat. It says then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. So Sosthenes was the head of the accusing party against Paul. And these unbelieving Greeks, they didn't care for Paul and they didn't care for the Jews. However, the Greeks were indignant against Sosthenes for bringing a matter like this before the new proconsul, before the tribunal, and you're, you guys are interrupting the proper business of the court. And in a rage, they beat Sosthenes before he even got out of the magistrate's presence. And so Gallio, just like all other Romans, regarded the Jews with contempt. He could care less what they did to Sosthenes, whether he got a beating or not. So it's interesting that the accuser is the one that gets the beating this time by the mob. And it's very unlikely, by the way, that this same Sosthenes referred to here is the one referred to in 1 Corinthians 1, 
1, and Paul calls Sosthenes his brother in 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. This Sosthenes was the enemy of Paul, and the name was very common in those days. So most experts or theologians will say, look, I don't, they don't believe it's the same guy. I don't, I don't, the Bible doesn't tell us and I don't know, uh, but it's probably unlikely. Okay, verse 18, it says, so Paul still remained a good while, many days. He took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And it said he had his hair cut off at Senscria, uh, for he had taken a vow. So Paul had his hair cut off as part of a Nazarite vow that he had made. And it doesn't tell us why he made the vow. It may have been in gratitude for God's blessing for Paul's safekeeping at Corinth because it was very common for the Jews to make such vows to God as an expression of gratitude or devotedness. Uh, when they were raised from sickness, when they're delivered from danger or calamity, that was common. Now, Centria was on the eastern har harbor of Corinth, and this is where he cut his hair. And remember the Nazarite vow that you read about in uh, Numbers chapter 6 was a vow that uh, involved cutting your, your hair, um, not cutting your hair for a period of time, and then at the end of the vow, uh, cutting it all off, shaving it all off, and it also involved abstinence from drinking uh, liquor or wine. So at the end of the period, the hair is shaved off and it's burned with other sacrifices as a symbol of an offering of oneself to God. So this is the, uh, the point. He cut his hair off. He may have taken it with him to Jerusalem to offer it as a sacrifice because he went to Jerusalem shortly after this. But uh, the Nazarites during the vow let their hair grow. Verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So P Paul, remember, had tried to go to Ephesus earlier. We read about this and the Holy Spirit pre prevented that or forbid him to do, to do that. And we're not told how or why, uh, but during his second uh, missionary trip, the Holy Spirit kept him from doing that. And that would have taken him to Ephesus if he'd gone the route he wanted to go. But instead, Paul went northwest, not southwest, but northwest to the Aegean port of Troas. And then he took the message to Macedonia. He took the message of the gospel to Europe. You know, we always have to entrust God with his timing, as Paul did. You know, God determines when and where at the right place at the right time. And it wasn't there, the right place at the right time, but now it was time for Paul to teach in Ephesus. Ephesus is a, a city in Asia Minor. It's about 40 miles, about 65 kilometers south of Smyrna. This city was famous for the Temple of Diana, uh, one of the wonders of the world. So when he got there, again, more idols, right? Verse 20, when, when they asked him to stay a, a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem but I will return again to you, God willing, and he sailed from Ephesus. And this is important. We always have to say, you know, God willing. I mean, we all have plans. Uh, we make plans. We, we move forward. But in James uh, chapter 4, verses 13, 14, and 15, it gives us the reason to, you know, we should plan ahead. We should, you know, have maybe a five-year, 10-year plan, whatever, you know, make plans for the future. But God willing, those plans happen. They don't always come uh, to fruition the way we think. Uh, here, James wrote in verse 13 of chapter 4, Come now, you who say tomorrow or today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So he's going to head to keep the feast in Jerusalem. Uh, in looking at this, it, it could have been the spring holy days or Pentecost is one of those. That, and it's kind of divided as to which. Um, but anyway, uh, verse 22, 
And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up, when it says gone up, uh, he, that means up to Jerusalem because you go down to Antioch. He said in, when he had gone up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. So it's likely that Paul completed his vow when he went up to Jerusalem and he greeted the church there and then he returns to Antioch. And this ended Paul's second missionary journey, one that covered about 300 miles, about 480 kilometers. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went all over the region of Galatia, Phrygia, in order or successively strengthening all the disciples. So on his third missionary trip, Paul traveled back through Asia Minor, visiting the churches that had been established on his previous trips. And those cities included Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and Ephesus. So we are out of time. We're going to end there because we're about to get into the ministry of Apollos just in the last few verses. But we'll save that for, for next time because it really kind of blends into chapter 19 real well. But we've covered a lot tonight. I uh, hope that you've uh, learned a little or at least had a good review of some of the basic things in this book of Acts. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we only have uh, February and, and uh, maybe one more in March before the time change. Uh, those will be our last Friday night Bible studies until the fall. So we hope you can tune in and enjoy the rest of the book of Acts. Happy Sabbath. Have a restful Sabbath. See you next week. For more information, go to our website at cogassembly.org. Copyright 2022. Church of God Assembly. All rights reserved.